everybody! So today we are going to talk about one of the fathers of the English literature, of the English language, and I'm talking about Geoffrey Chaucer. He lived in uh, the uh, 14th century, was son of a, of a merchant, of a wine merchant, so he had the opportunity to know this social class very well when he was young, he also travelled a lot, and then he also had the opportunity to uh, know very well the court cycles uh, and to know more about the court uh, uh, cultures, attitude and behaviors. At the age of 19 he uh, took part in the Hundred Years War and he was also uh, t taken uh, prisoner by the French, uh, then um, ransomed by the king, by uh, King Edward III. Uh, after this he uh, started working um, at the court and he also uh, was often abroad for some diplomatic missions. This gave him the opportunity to travel, uh, to know the world and to know different realities, different worlds, different cultures, different countries, different social classes, different realities, but also he also had the opportunity to watch England from from the outside world, okay, from outside, so to have a new point of view of England, uh, a detached point of view, uh, so he could develop a sort of a criticism towards England, towards, towards different social classes, towards culture at the time. Well, um, he also had the opportunity to meet um, in Italy uh, Petrarca, Boccaccio, to read some Dante and it influenced his work a lot. Uh, when he died, uh, when, uh, when Chaucer died, he was the first poet to be buried uh, in uh, the Poets' Corner at Westminster Abbey. Now, uh, he, I, I, said, uh, I said before that he was one of the fathers of the English literature, but especially of the English language. Why? So, first of all, because he was the first, or one of the first ones, but anyway, the most important author who decided to write his masterpiece in Middle English. It was completely new, okay? It was a revolution as far as the language was concerned, okay? Shakespeare's language wouldn't have been uh, the language it was if it hadn't been for Chaucer before, okay? He had more, more or less the same role that uh, Dante had in Italy uh, when he decided to write uh, Divina Commedia in uh, uh, Volgare instead of Latin, okay? So that was a complete revolution as far as language was concerned, okay, was the first one who used Middle English. But this isn't the only uh, revolutionary part of his works. There are many. Now we'll see them, we'll analyze them. First of all, his works can be divided into three periods. The first period is, is extremely influenced by French literature. Uh, I can mention many works, but mm, probably uh, amongst the most famous ones there, there is uh, uh, Le Roman de la Rose or uh, the Book of the Duchess, there are many others anyway. Then there is a second period uh, which is very influenced by the Italian and Latin culture. And in this case we could eventually uh, mention the House of Fame maybe or uh, the Legend of Good Women. And then the third period. The third period was the so-called English period, and it was the period when he wrote his masterpiece, so the Canterbury Tales, uh, during the very last part of his life. So he had had the opportunity to know so much about the world, about England, uh, to um, develop uh, criticism and analysis, and then he wrote this incredible work. Uh, of course, uh, the fact that he traveled so much could give him uh, um, as I said before, a um, very important perspective in order to write the Canterbury Tales. He wanted to portray England, to, give a, to write a sort of a mirror, a portrait okay, of uh, his own 
country uh, and uh, he uh, took some inspiration from Boccaccio, the Cameron, okay, uh, especially in the structure of the Canterbury Tales because the different tales are, uh, are um, told by the different uh, um, characters, okay, uh, during the plot basically. The plot, so um, this is about a pilgrimage, a pilgrimage that uh, uh, 29 pilgrims started from uh, um, from a tavern in, in London which was called uh, Tobard Inn uh, in April. Uh, they decided to start the pilgrimage and the host uh, offered to be the guide and started a sort of a literary challenge, okay, because he asked them to, he asked each uh, pilgrim to tell two stories, two tales, okay, on the way to Canterbury and uh, other two tales on their way back. The most uh, interesting or most uh, beautiful story um, could be um, rewarded with a free soup uh, when they came back to the ta to the tavern. So Chaucer was invited, okay, to this pilgrimage, and he starts um, giving us sort of an introduction of uh, all of the other char characters. They belong to almost all social classes. I say almost because two are missing, but we'll see that later. These social classes belonged to uh, three groups, we can say so. So one group represented the uh, declining feudal system, the, de the declining feudal work, world of England in England at the time. Um, amongst the others there are the, the knight, the pardoner, they're all characters that remind us of that hierarchical uh, structure of the social ladder of the time, this very strict and uh, immobile uh, social system that belonged to mid the Middle Age and uh, it was obviously the feudal system. Then, uh, second group, clergymen. Okay, so characters connected with religion, there were many, the friar, the nun, the monk, there are many. Uh, and then third group, town people. Town people, so in this case there are many people uh, belonging to different environments. There's the wife of Bath, uh, the plowman, uh, there's the physician, uh, the students of Oxford. There are many different uh, uh, perspectives also in this case. I said before that two social classes are missing. Which ones? Well, um, the upper aristocracy is completely missing, okay. Uh, and also the laborers, okay, these are the two classes that aren't actually mentioned. Uh, we can say that there is anyway a large range that is described there, uh, and most of them, uh, or anyway, many of them belong to the rising class at the time, so the middle class. Uh, that was something completely new because it meant also the end approaching okay, of the feudal system, as we said before. At first uh, it seems that uh, Chaucer respects the, the hierarchical order uh, while he introduces the knight um, first, basically. But then uh, the, character, uh, the characters talk okay, uh, in an absolutely random uh, order, okay, there is no social ladder, they are all mixed up, they are all the same, they are considered as individuals. So there is no hierarchy, okay, and uh, the feudal hierarchy is completely shattered, is completely destroyed here. They are absolutely, uh, this is something very different from Boccaccio, because uh, I said that the structure was inspired by the Decameron, which is true, but in Boccaccio's work um, all the characters belong to aristocracy, they all belong to the same class. This is something completely different, very new, very revolutionary. Um, anyway, I said that uh, Chaucer wants to describe uh, characters in details, uh, and uh, for this reason he uh, started a sort of a psychological study of these characters uh, and for every single character he uh, gave a sort of a picture uh, which was uh, apparently sort of a also physical picture, but uh, he never expresses uh, uh, moral or ethical judgments explicitly, but we can uh, recognize his uh, opinion or his satire 
in the descriptions he gave. So basically he uses a lot of humor, a lot of a subtle irony, very witty um, descriptions and uh, uh, in behind we can say so the physical features of the characters or the attitude we can recognize uh, his psychological study and his satire as far as that specific social class was concerned. Let's think for example about the, um, the pardoner. The pardoner is de described um, in details, also physically. Um, his uh, attitude is also described. He is sneaky uh, and then he is fat and unctuous, uh, greasy. Um, and uh, yes, uh, that was a sort of a, it was a way to describe basically his moral attitude and his moral features and uh, uh, the role of of uh, the church as far as this part of uh, um, the economical uh, um, aspect was concerned. So, as I said before, he used a lot of irony. Um, also in the prologue, uh, he says that, uh, okay, a pilgrimage in April, okay, he doesn't really say that, but we understand that he is uh, uh, considering this, this, this travel okay, in April more uh, like a holiday than a penitence. And, uh, and so he says that uh, it was quite, uh, or better, we understand the, hip the hypocrisy okay, that there is behind this pilgrimage. And uh, he also says that uh, people, pilgrims, people who go to visit uh, uh, Thomas Beckett's um, uh, grave, okay, this is why they're going to Canterbury, obviously, okay, because in Canterbury uh, there is his grave, Thomas Beckett's grave. And uh, they go there in order to ask for something to receive or now or in the future. So this is quite a selfish attitude, okay? So this is also quite uh, ironic and uh, there is satire also uh, in, in this um, sort of a, an interpretation or reinterpretation of something that was con considered absolutely sacred at the time. Now, um, we can consider the, uh, the revolutionary uh, aspects of this work from two different points of view. Well, three actually. One is the language, I mentioned it before, I repeat it again, which is Middle English, this is very, very important. Then there is a social point of view, uh, because as I said before, uh, pilgrims going to Canterbury, uh, less less in penitence than an holiday um, are the symbol of this new uh, medieval England uh, full of contradictions but still strong still self-confident so yes there is the end decay of the feudal system but uh, anyway the, the past values and uh, social classes are still very self-confident and are still absolutely structured. Then uh, another important point of view is the literary point of view. As I said before, he took an inspiration from Italy, uh, so from Renaissance, and uh, he was the first author who uh, took Renaissance to England, okay, maybe two centuries before other other authors, which was quite new. And actually, it's a uh, quite it's a contradiction. Um, I mean, these two aspects, okay, the social aspect uh, that uh, anyway affirms the new medieval England uh, with many contradictions inside but still strong uh, in its values. And on the other side, the fact that uh, Renaissance arrives now, okay, uh, very early in England. So the two uh, sides can be contradictory somehow, but it is also the uh, great and revolutionary um, genius of Geoffrey Chaucer, okay, this is absolutely great. And it is also great how we can read his work today, his works today as well, and uh, even if social classes have 
changed partially <laughs> changed but human nature hasn't so his uh, satire his irony is uh, still very very modern and uh, it's absolute probably and uh, it's a, a very interesting to um, to know more and to study more about psychology about individuals okay through his words his words coming from the the 14th century and still so so modern today so universal probably because the human nature is universal after all so thank you very much for listening i hope this has been interesting for you if you have any questions please just leave me a comment below and uh, i'm here for you see you very soon with another uh, class okay about english literature thank you bye